seventh meeting of the 128th season took place online via Zoom on Tuesday, the 18th of May, 2021. Professor James Raven, president, was in the chair. After the minutes of the previous meeting had been read and signed, the president introduced Professor Miriam Foote, who delivered the 2021 Homi and Firozzi Vandiere lecture entitled New Movements in French 20th Century Binding Design, the Importance of Patronage. When the meeting was open to discussion, the following took part. The president, Ms. Victoria Daly, Mr. Robert Laurie, Ms. Martha Romero, Ms. Robin Myers, Mr. Barry Mackay, and Dr. Jenny Stratford. The president thanked Professor Foote warmly for her paper. May I check if there's a press ready? So I should say that um, I am Meg Ford, I'm the past president of the society, and I'm standing in this evening for James Raven, our current president, who's unable to be here this evening and very much regrets it, but um, a, a medical issue is taken care of and we wish him a very speedy recovery. Um, it's a special evening this evening, um, partly because we're here in person. This is the first time since the beginning of COVID and it's delightful to see so many people in the audience and it's delightful to know that people are joining us you know, remotely as well, so thank you for that. It is the first time we've done this hybrid session, so it will be a bit of a trial and error, so please do um, be patient with us. Um, we're very grateful to the Society of Antiquaries IT specialist, Matthew, who's going to give us a hand as well and keep an eye on us. Um, and we would welcome your comments afterwards as you know, what you thought worked well, what we can improve on next time. It is a, a learning process. But it's also a special evening this evening because I will be presenting the gold medal to Michael Twyman and I will start with that. So all of us working in the history of the book will know something of Michael Twyman, but few of us will know the full extent of his multifaceted contributions of life devoted to typography, printing, and communication. Professor Twyman has taught printing and design history at the University of Reading since 1959, and indeed it was he who established the university's course, Typography and Graphic Communication, combining intellectual and practical work. It was the first such course at a British university, and its success led to the establishment of a department of the same name in 1974. Over the, his long tenure at the University of Reading, he is now Professor Emeritus of the department, Michael has focused on four main areas of research. The history of lithography, 19th century jobbing and ephemeral printing, printing techniques and processes, and developing a graphic language often as it relates to education. And Michael has not only assiduously researched in these areas, but he has thought deeply about their relevance and impact, proposing a schema for describing graphic language and reflecting on the long-term significance of printed ephemera. He has also been instrumental in bringing together scholars and practitioners in his roles as founder member of the Printing Historical Society in 1964, and serves as its honorary president and vice president, founder and director of the University of Reading's Center for Ephemeral Studies, president of the Ephemera Society, chair of the National Printing Her Heritage Trust, and chair of the advisory committee of the St. Bride Library in London. Beyond the campus of Reading, Michael has taught at rare book schools of Virginia, Lyon, Wellington, and Melbourne. Importantly, Michael's teaching has always included handling physical materials wherever he teaches. It is no exaggeration to calculate that Michael has guided thousands of historians of the book, printers, designers, dealers, and collectors, through his publications and teaching on three continents. Perhaps Michael's greatest contribution has been to the study of lithography, its processes, techniques, and products. Already in 1970, he published his Lithography 1880 to 1850, and in the spirit of handling physical books, I brought along Christie's own copy of that book. I am proud to say purchased in the very year of publication, 1970, as well as some other examples uh, here, including one from the Society of Antiquaries Library. This is followed by works on color lithography, early lithographic books and music, and in 2000, he delivered the Panizzi lectures on the subject at the British Library. Fortunately for us, he continues to work on lithography, and we may expect a study 
of the reproduction, lithographic reproductions of the Bayou Tapestry at some point in the near future. Some of that research is being undertaken here at the Society of Antiquaries. I began by alluding to activities perhaps less well known to us. Who among us knew that Michael was a printmaker, producing and, in his earlier years, exhibiting and even selling his artworks? The Bibliographical Society is not the first to honor Michael. He has also been awarded the Pepys Medal for Outstanding Contributions to Ephemera as long ago as 1983. And in 2014, he received the Sir Misha Black Medal for his contribution to design education. On behalf of the Bibliographical Society, I now ask Professor Twyman to step forward to receive the Society's Gold Medal. I've been told I may say a few words, and there will be a few indeed, I have to say. But I'm deeply honored to receive this uh, uh, particular medal, more, if I may say so, than the other medals that you mentioned. <laughs> and that's partly because it recognizes lithography as a, as a discipline. And I'd like to think that I've played some part in establishing uh, uh, that process. Uh, as such. Um, it's also particularly touching because I know other people here perhaps know this, but my first public lecture was to the Bibliographical Society. None of you could possibly have been there <laughs> in 1966 or, or, or whenever it was. But uh, I say that because to me this is the tail end, as it were, of my career. But in a sense, it started here. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. A very happy occasion. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we will this evening, uh, just going on from our other special reasons for this evening, is that we have a new format this evening, and we have a, a panel of grant recipients so as I hope you all know, the society does give grants and bursaries, and we've never actually invited, well, we have invited individuals, but we've never had a, a panel of them to hear about their current work. And so we thought this was a way not only for, for them to be able to present something to us, but for us to really see you know, what our work is going to, towards and supporting. So very pleased that we have three grant recipients this evening who will present us with it. So they will each speak for about 15 minutes. We will have then a short time for questions afterwards. And again, in the hybrid link, I mean, obviously we will recognize um, speakers in the audience, but if you could still state your name, it will be uh, handiest for us. And those online, you're also able to ask questions and our secretary, Karen Linda Hertz, will field those questions. Um, you'll, for people in the audience, we, we, you will need to wait for a microphone. Um, so just hold on for that for a moment. But before we move on to opening the, the panel, I just want to give you a little bit of news. Um, we have some other events for you as well. I mean, first of all, on Thursday, we are hosting an event at Middle Temple, and thanks to Renee Satterley, who's here, is both a participant and a host, um, called The Book That Changed My Life. And I mean, who can resist you know, attending a lecture like, you know, or a panel like that? So again, we're going to have four people who will tell us their stories and some of them will actually bring works with them that, uh, in, as, as examples of books that did change their lives. And of course, we're all in this work together. So I think we all, you know, have a, had a book, you know, that did change our lives. And it's, you know, we'd love to hear about that. So depending on their reaction to that, uh, we may even have that as a forthcoming series um, and to, to be repeated with, um, with different stories every time. So that's on Thursday. Please go to the website and register. It's also available um, to be joined online, so you don't have to be there physically if you can't make it. Um, we're also in the plans of um, the process of planning a winter visit, and this will be a virtual visit. We don't know yet where it is, but again, stay tuned to the, to the website. Plans are still developing. And um, actually, even before that, then I just call your attention to the Panizzi lectures, 
that will be delivered by Cynthia Brockow on woodblock printing and Chinese book production. And the first of that series of three will be held on the 30th of November at the British Library. Also a hybrid event, so you can book tickets to be present online, but they just need to book, um, or also just sign up for a link to join online. And then we hope later in May to reactivate something that we had planned um, that had to be canceled because of COVID, and that's a bibliographical skills workshop that will take place in Manchester. And we're grateful to Julianne Simpson, a council member, for um, planning that. And we hope now in, in May, uh, other things you know, permitting, that we'll be able to go forward with that. So now, after that rather long introduction, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first panelist of this evening. Um, and uh, I was just, I think I've already said this, that we're going to have each 15 minute presenter and then a series of questions if, um, just directly after each one. Eduardo Fernandez Guerrero is a doctoral fellow in history at the university, uh, at the European University Institute in Florence. He holds a degree in classical philology from the Universidad Autonoma of Madrid and a master's also in classical philology from the Universidad Complutense of Madrid. His doctoral thesis studies the circulation and uses of the apoc apoc sorry, <laughs> Apocalypsis Nova, a text combining prophecy, theology, and sacred history that became widely popular in early modern Europe and beyond. He was an early stage researcher at the Spanish Nat National Research Council and has been a visiting fellow at the Scuola Normale Superiore of, Superiore of uh, Pisa and the Catholic University of Melbourne. His wider interests research, his, sorry, I've really kind of lost it after all this talking. His wider research interests include early 16th century Venetian printed books, early modern church reform, and Mediterranean interreligious contact. So, Eduardo, please come up and take your places. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you um, for coming. Thank you for the presentation, Meg. And again, thank you to the Bibliographical Society and its members for the support that um, they have generously given to my work. Um, those who visit the Church of San Pietro in Montorio in Rome are often puzzled by an odd, almost hidden depiction of a book. Under the altar of the Borgherini Chapel, Sebastiano del Piombo painted a sealed book around 1523 with a small card reading, Aperiatur in Tempore, it shall be open when the time comes. The book is barely visible because of its position, and yet it, is, it sits in a key place within the chapel's pictorial program and is placed like relics traditionally are uh, under the altar. A book, therefore, portrayed as a relic to be unsealed and revealed when the time comes. My research focuses precisely on the circulation and readership of that book, better known as Apocalypsis Nova, or New Revelation, a series of visions blending prophecy, theology, and sacred history, reportedly given by the angel Gabriel to a Franciscan friar named Amadeus around 1481. Its main prophetic element, the arrival of an angelic pope who would reform the church and usher in a golden age of peace and justice, would contribute greatly to its popularity. From the reported discovery in 1502 um, of the original manuscript to the copies made in Mexico and India in the 17th century, I study the ways in which its authority was built, used, and contested in religious, intellectual, or even political contexts throughout Catholic Europe. Today, I would like to focus on one of its fundamental elements, often ignored by the scholars who have worked on the Apocalypsis Nova, which is the relationship between the text and its material support, or in other words, the links between manuscript production and readership. But first, let's go back to San Pietro in Montorio. It was there, uh, according to some later traditions, that Amadeus had received his revelations perhaps even at the cave upon which Bramante would be late decades later um, would have built his famous Tempietto. It was there that they were written, these revelations, and it was there that two decades after, uh, a group of cardinals and theologians gathered in secret to open the freshly discovered original manuscript and read it for the first time. 
That is at least according to the letters of a Franciscan theologian named Giorgio Benigno Salviati, who was charged with making the first copy from the original. Unsurprisingly, <laughs> this original soon went missing, and all that was left was a copy or copies uh, deemed to be uh, corrupt with interpolations by Salviati himself. I will return later to the problem raised by these interpolations and these accusations, but despite them, the Apocalypse novel nevertheless reached the libraries of cardinals, kings, and queens uh, alike in the very first years of its circulation. Research on the Apocalypse Nova has um, focused on, so far on issues such as its authorship or its relationship to artists just Leonardo da Vinci or Raphael. This attention to the intellectual genealogy of the text, however, has led to a perception of the Apocalypse Nova as a somehow disembodied, abstract, ever-constant text with little to no attention to it as a book, or in other words, to the material aspects of its making and reading. I therefore undertook the task, held greatly by the support of the Bibliographical Society, of doing a comprehensive search for, manuscripts, uh, for manuscript copies of the Apocalypse Nova. Considering both partial and full copies uh, without chronological limits led to the discovery of 41 new copies from the previously known 63. All 104 were examined and briefly described, um, including ecological aspects such as watermarks, choir formation, catchwords, etc., together with a transcription of um, all sorry of all texts bound together with. Uh, these manuscripts, with the Apocalypse Nova in these manuscripts. This is an example of the catalog. Besides this, uh, a list of lost copies um, was drawn, pushing the number of copies of the Apocalypse Nova that ever existed to 128. The resulting 300-page catalog, which does not include translations, not only sheds light on the material elements that allow the act of reading the Apocalypse Nova and their change over time, but also shows the reading practices and mechanisms of book circulation it was subject to. It constitutes, to my knowledge, one of the very few cases of a systematic description of the same text throughout almost three centuries of copies. Now that I have briefly presented the Apocalypse Nova and summarized some of my archival work on it, let me just raise two of the questions that have emerged from my research. Uh, on it. First, the diachronic change uh, of manuscript production and reading in the case of the Apocalypse Nova, and secondly, the nature of its relationship to the manuscript format. Sadly, we don't have enough time today to discuss the transmission of the Apocalypse Nova in terms of quantitative codicology, codicology as much as it could be done for such a small corpus. However, this graph and map summarizes much of it. The Apocalypse Nova was most frequently copied in Italy, and it experienced two popularity phases with the clear stagnation between 1540 and 1610. Paratextual elements surrounding the Apocalypse Nova allow us to reconstruct some of the ways that readers engage with it, um, while their combination with codicological aspects often sheds light on the way that makers, prefer makers and scribes, uh, who were most often, uh, most often readers themselves considered these revelations. For example, um, in the earlier phases of its circulation, mostly in the first half of the 16th century, copies are more likely to contain notes indicating belief in the truth of Amadeus' revelation. See, for instance, Nicolò Begani's distichs to one of the copies he prepared, now kept at the Biblioteca Marciana, describing it as an arcane uh, work full of the Holy Ghost revealed by the angel Gabriel. Or instead, Begani's contemporary Bernardino dei Conti, a protonotary apostolic and lawyer of both laws, who longed for the arrival of the angelic pope as he writes in the copy he commissioned in 1525. Um, yeah. Over time, however, the modes of reading and the types of copies start to differ. If the earliest copies would be presented almost in a single block without any indication of the start of a new chapter, he called raptus or raptures, later copies would tend to become more clearly articulated, adding a new series of subsections and reference signs to render consultation much easier. Um, as you can see here, this is um, 
two copies of the same fragment of the same passage of the text with over a century difference and the development of all these like reference signs in the margins or system of revelatio instead of um, raptus and so on. Um, this trend uh, runs parallel to the development of elaborate indices in later manuscripts such as this one, uh, which is the manuscript copied at the Franciscan convent of Santiago de Tlatelolco in Mexico, now at the Bancroft Library, where three ex relatively long indices were drafted of passages from the Holy Scripture cited, songs and hymns in the book, or a general table of co contents, and yeah. However, in contrast to these models of intellectual engagement with the book, the late 17th century stands out within the tradition of the Apocalypsis Nova for the rise of collection copies, I would say. Some lavish exemplars without any signs of active reading, indices, or reference systems, a type of book actually particularly common in aristocratic collections. As the popularity of the text rose, so did its status as a rare book, and the value did not depend anymore on its contents, uh, but rather on the social convention around it. These copies capture a certain perspective over the Apocalypsis Nova, that of the makers. When Begano produces his lavish copies and instructs them with poems in praise of Amadeus and his holiness, this certainly reflects his own reading of the Apocalypsis Nova. However, as the scribe of uh, five similarly composed manuscripts, his carefully crafted exemplars on their paratext guided and conditioned the reading experience of future readers who approach his manuscripts. Ultimately, the very self-explanatory conclusion of this is that the same text was read differently at different times by different people. And that for manuscript traditions, and that for man manuscript traditions, there is a dialogic relationship between production and readership where one constantly influences the other. One thing, however, within this change remained equal through time despite all of these different readings, which is the manuscript format. The circulation of the Apocalypse Nova constitutes a quite unique example among early modern texts. It was never printed, and yet these revelations circulated as a manuscript from the very early years of its discovery in 1502 up to the 19th century. What were the implications of such wide manuscript circulation in contrast to the printed book? What were the reasons for it to never have seen the press? First, there is a question of authority. When confronted with texts circulating both in print and manuscript format, scholars have traditionally pointed to printed books as some authoritative, stable, and widespread version. However, while a growing body of scholarship has challenged um, this, highlighting the instability of the early printed book and texts, the text circulating solely on manuscript form raised a different set of problems and questions. How was authority and reliability achieved for the Apocalypsis Nova? How did scribes and those involved in the making of copies seek to create an authoritative version? And how did readers complement their efforts? If we consider how the Apocalypsis Nova was deemed to be riddled with interpolations added later by Salviati, as I mentioned before, it doesn't come as a surprise that many readers found all copies, um, sorry, um, that many readers found in older copies a more authoritative version of the text, perceived as closer to the original, now lost, than the more modern counterparts. See, for instance, this copy owned by the Spanish king Philip II, one of the earliest copies made in northern Italy in the 16th century, which was stored in the reliquary room of the monastery of El Escorial, together with other autographed books by saints like this 8th century copy of Augustine's De Baptismo Parvulorum on the basis solely of its apparent antiquity and which was reported the copy of the Apocalypsis Nova to be among the most authoritative and purest versions of the text by the very by early modern readers themselves. However, beyond the search of early copies, the Apocalypsis Nova textual tradition stands out for the, some proto-philological practices of readers who very often procured several copies of the text in order to compare them and identify potential interpolations. These practices shed light on the complex information networks of libraries and private book owners 
available to readers and scribes who often documented not only variants themselves, but even the source and signature of the manuscript they originated from. It is hard to discuss the wide array of cases and instances of these practices here today, but it's hopefully clear that the Apocalypsis novel provides another example of the crucial involvement of readers in the production of books in the early modern period, or rather the blurry lines distinguishing scribes, manuscript makers, readers, in the case of text whose traditions exist solely on manuscript forms. There isn't much time left to consider the question of why it was never printed, and this is something perhaps for the later discussion, but let me just say a few words about the reading experience of the handwritten word as opposed to the printed book. The manuscripts are always instinct with the presence of someone else. That's a second orality, as Walter Ong says. Either the author, the scribe, or the reader, and in the Apocalypse novel, one could say the presence of an angel, um, the traces are generally much more explicit in the handwritten pages than those printed. The human variation is here the opposite of the standardized, clear writing and reading. As Harold Love somewhat reluctantly writes, there is something remote and impersonal about the well-constructed typographic page that is the price that it exacts for permitting us to read at high speed. Revelations and prophecies such as Amadeus' alleged visions, written in first person, were built around the rich, dense moment of the encounter between human and divine. It is not surprising, therefore, to see a preference for this format, which enhances, like no other, the presence of the absent, and which exists not only as a record of the revelation, but as its physical proof and recreation. Thank you. introduction to your, your topic. It's not something that I myself am, uh, knew, ab knew about. So we can open it to questions from the audience, either in person or online. As I said, if you are in person, just wait for a microphone to be brought to you. And uh, even in any event, please do state your name when you begin. While we wait for people to kind of mull over that, I did have a, a question myself, actually two, uh, two observations. One, um, you talked about the, you know, the wide distribution. And for any individual manuscript, uh, any individual copy, did, is there evidence of it traveling very widely geographically? Or did they, did they actually stay in a fairly close geographic um, sort of circle? I would have to check my notes. But what I can say is that there is evidence of people traveling, and people traveling far to access a copy, and people accessing copies far away from where they usually were, from in both cases, I'm thinking from Germany to Italy or from different sides of Spain, uh, within Spain. Um, I cannot imagine, a, I can, it, it's hard to reconstruct that early, very early 16th, 17th century phase of the movement of manuscripts. When you retrace sort of like the history of each manuscript in, within a collection in a library, you often get up to the 18th century or something. Um, I don't. I could think about it, but then don't. Just to hear a little perspective about that. Very good. And uh, I'll go ahead and ask my second question, or rather more of an observation. I saw when you were just showing us your your notes on any particular manuscript mm -hmm. um, that that and that wonderful binding. I'm sure Miriam would have something to say about that. But you weren't dating that. So is that yes. intentional? Well, the copy itself is dated, um, as you can see in the last picture, it's dated from um, 1527. I am not an expert on uh, bindings, and um, my training is of that of a Latinist and philologist. Um, but no, there is like plenty of work to do about those cases as well. So that would be another clue as to its circulation and use. Yeah. 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 Fascinating one. Um, yes. David Kittrick, I can say your name for you. <laughs> we need a microphone. Just one moment, please. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, the uh, binding you showed on that Copenhagen copy was extraordinary because it's, it's right at the beginning of what you were talking about. Um, because it looks pristine, all right, it's made up of bits and so forth. It looks quite different from the binding you showed much later, that la later Italian binding. And I wonder if you could reflect a little on the history of this copy. 
Did it come through a correction in, in Copenhagen or how? Do you remember? That, that's a great question. Thank you very much. The, this copy was bought in 1961 by the Royal Library of Denmark from a Danish antiquarian. The copy itself seems to be from southern Italy. It's bound in a page of uh, breviarium uh, in this type of, um, uh, what's the name? Uh, well, in it, it, there are reasons to think that this type of breviarium was composed in southern Italy. So that, in combination to the watermark that points to, as if I remember correctly, Marign Marigliano, uh, seems to suggest that it may come from southern Italy. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Eduardo. That was really good. Um, I'm Jacob from St. Andrews. Um, this is quite a sort of just simple question, um, but just how lengthy are these texts? Are they quite compact or are they, or are they big, bulky volumes? The, um, I was mentioning these letters by Giorgio Benigno Salviati in the beginning. Uh, he himself describes the book as big as the city of God of Augustine. Um, it's around, it's usually around 200 um, folios, um, and just to add something to that, usually it takes scribes, because often scribes would write down how long they took them, it took them to make a copy, usually three to four weeks, if not more. So it's a, a significant text, it's not a short, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes, I thought Mary had a hand. Um, anyone else, or, uh, yes? Thank you. Um, did you mention the name of the illuminator of the last slide? Did that I one, mention presumably? the name of the illuminator of the, uh, this? Yeah. No, uh, I am not aware of who was the illumin who illuminated this. Um, and there is actually a conversation about this potentially being um, a copy paste from a previous um, um, engraving. Um, Paste it here. But no, there's no. Thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, I think we will thank Eduardo again and move on to next one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we just bring up our uh, next presentation. I now have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Yelda Nesoglu. She is an early career researcher in the history of early modern mathematics and architecture and an associate member of the Faculty of History at Oxford. She was trained as an architect in New York, studied history of science, medicine, and technology at Oxford, and received her doctorate in architectural history from McGill with her dissertation, Robert Hooke's Praxis, Reading, Drawing, Building, in 2018, which she is currently turning into a book. She's been a researcher with the AHRC-funded project Reading Euclid's Elements of Geometry in Early Modern Britain and Ireland, and is one of the editors of Hooke's Hooke's Database. So, Yelda. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, are you able to hear me? Um, I'd like to start also with a note of thanks to the Society for their support of my work. I will not be able to present that part of my research as it has been delayed by the pandemic, but now that I've been able to make it to the UK, I hope to be able to report to you on that uh, when I will have undertaken it. Now, my title is Tracing the Circulation of Mathematical Books in Early Modern Britain Through Book Catalogues, which is not as, as explanatory as I would have liked. Perhaps it would have been more accurate to say tracing the circulation of mathematical ideas through book catalogues so that it doesn't sound like it's about ticking off math titles in books. It may be helpful to contextualize this research, how it began, what it aims to achieve, 
and also to consider the weaknesses of its approach and share a few ways in which I think these can be remedied somewhat. To go really back, um, uh, as mentioned, I wrote my dissertation on Robert Hooke's architectural work, especially its intellectual connections to his scientific activity. I had been particularly intrigued by how Hooke learned the craft of building outside of the traditional apprenticeship system, that is, without learning hands-on at the construction site. A clue was provided by Joseph Moxon, who in his mechanic exercises in the volume of, on uh, bricklaying published in 1700 to be specific, mentioned that Hooke had discovered the upside down arch system for foundations in Alberti's treatise on architecture and used it in his design for the Montague House, which as some of you may be aware, later became the first building of the British Museum. So that's a Hooke building. Now this led me to look more closely at Hooke's library and how he and others used books to learn craft skills. Hooke famously said in an unpublished work, alas, that natural knowledge could be sought in three places. First in books, secondly in men, and thirdly in the things themselves, i.e. through the perusal of books, the consulting of men, and the examination and trial of things. And we can find cases where Royal Society fellows are discussing classical works of history in search of cement, cement recipes. It's been pointed out that Hooke had a preference, in architectural books at least, for more practical titles than grand theoretical works. This made me wonder how much of this was actually a preference. Did he simply not have access to those theory-heavy treatises, or was it his choice? We are lucky that several of Hooke's lists of desiderata from book auctions have survived, and I was able to match them to specific catalogs to see other works he was, that were available to him, but did, he, did, he chose not to purchase. Now, uh, by the way, this part of this research can be found on our collaborative website with Will Pohl and Kilsky Henderson on Hooke's book. So um, there you have the list of uh, the desiderata and uh, the auction catalogs that they match. Um, I'm sure everybody is familiar with the site, I hope, anyway. <laughs> We've been keeping it alive. Um, so it includes the uh, searchable database, uh, searchable database of the 1703 auction catalog, as well as other titles that bear his ownership marks uh, and that are not uh, mentioned in Biblioteca Hookiana. Now, according to the Desiderata, Hook did have access to some of the more theoretical treatises, which he did not bid on, but considering about 30% of the extant, ti extant titles associated with him are not listed in Biblioteca Hookiana, we cannot be at all certain that he did not own those titles at some point. So this is where looking at book catalogs becomes a bit uh, key. Now, book catalogs can also be useful in terms of identifying how libraries and specific collections can become distributed fields of influence. While in school, Hooke famously learned Euclid in the library of Richard Busby, the headmaster at uh, Westminster School. A comparison between their libraries in terms of their mathematical content revealed an overlap of about 50%. So Hooke had about 50% of the titles that were in Busby's library. There's some work to do to be more assertive about this. It could be that those were the only titles available at that time period. But it is also possible that collections exert influence well outside of their walls. Another progenitor of this research is indeed the AHRC-funded Reading Euclid's Elements of Geometry in Early Modern Britain and Ireland project based at Oxford in 2016 and 18 to 18. In that project, my colleagues and I studied the reception of this classical work on geometry by examining editorial, educational, and readerly practices in Britain and Ireland up to 1700. In particular, we examined extant copies of the book for material evidence that showed how and for what purposes the text was read. Yet examining these copies alone was presenting less than an accurate picture of how and to what extent the text was circulated during this period. For instance, none of Hooke's around 30 copies of Euclid have survived. In order to understand better the circulation of these Euclidean titles, I began to survey contemporary book catalogs in manuscript and print of personal and institutional libraries to determine which editions were particularly useful, uh, particularly popular, sorry, and in cases where information on the background of the owners was available, 
to understand the types of uses these books may have been put to. And that's how the catalog of catalogs began. And uh, it rather soon got out of hand. Uh, I was trying to stop at 1,700 and expecting there to be a few hundred book catalogs. And now I'm up to 1,912, and it's not finished. Now, at the moment, it's not, um, it's not public, just because I'm still cleaning it up. But eventually, it will be made public for everybody's uh, use. And what it includes is um, uh, it's a relational database for those who are more technically uh, interested in this kind of thing. Um, but uh, I'm thinking of uh, playing around with the kind of database type it is. And of course, I've also been collecting the titles, uh, the, the, the copies as well, and when available, multiple copies of the same title because I realized that each catalog, the print, the, each copy of the catalog is actually unique because people have scribbled notes in them, um, purchases that they would like to make, prices that were paid, and as in some cases, indeed, the names of the purchasers. So um, each of the catalog, uh, the, each of the copy of the catalog is uh, treated as a separate book. What kinds of uh, uh, material are included in this? So in print, I have been including catalogs of institutional libraries, and I realized soon that I will need to uh, curb this somewhat because uh, you know, books have been written on Cambridge Library, and there's no way I can uh, uh, include all of those um, uh, catalogs, uh, especially the manuscript catalogs. Um, but th there are some institutions that no longer exist, and their catalogs are particularly interesting, like the Scion College, for instance. And general catalogs of printed works, bookseller catalogs, some of these are for trade, some of them for retail, auction catalogs, of course, Sale catalogs of libraries of individuals sold without auction, bequests, advertisements by booksellers or publishers appended to books, bibliographical lists. These are you know, books that are recommended to uh, each other, to, to people. Um, in manuscript, they include personal library lists, wills and inventories that include book titles, lists of desiderata, like hooks, um, books uh, from auctions and shopping lists that sometimes people sent to friends in, uh, via correspondence. Catalogues of confiscated libraries are especially interesting uh, during the Civil War. Catholic libraries uh, on the continent, because a lot of mathematicians, Catholic mathematicians, were expelled from Oxford and they actually ended up in Rome and they were continuing their mathematical uh, activities under the Jesuits, but they were English and, uh, or or Welsh or Irish, of course. Um, catalogues of institutional libraries. Uh, I think I recently saw like the Glasgow Library. Uh, there's a uh, manuscript catalog long before there was, uh, of course, a print catalog. And I'm also interested, of course, in uh, how books were sent overseas, uh, like the Levant Company. Uh, there, are book cat uh, there are library uh, catalogs of the Levant Company in Istanbul and other places. And there is some circulation of material with India as well. For instance, Hook mentions an um, algebra book or um, Indian algebra book that was brought to him by a captain. I haven't been able to locate what this book was, but um, it's supposed to, it's, uh, it came from India. And of course, in manuscript, bequest institutional libraries, which again, I have to somehow curb or uh, maybe when other people can contribute to this because there are many librarians who can do a much better job at this who know their own college libraries much better. Now, just looking at these book catalogs is actually not enough, I found. Because there are many cases where uh, individuals like women are underrepresented in terms of the survival of book catalogs. So do we assume they didn't have books? No. Um, so somehow we need to balance this with, uh, I think, the the current theme, uh, the current term is distant reading and close reading, but as an architect, I'd like to use it as a bird's eye view and street view so that we can look at these sort of met meta, meta catalogs and uh, look at how these catalogs function, but also treat the individual copies of books that bear ownership marks uh, and include those in terms of the circulation of ideas. So how can this be done? Um, 
I'm experimenting with uh, reconstituting library catalogs from uh, ownership inscriptions and also from hammer copies of auction catalogs. So I know, for instance, the, the catalog of the Royal Mathematical School has not survived, but we know that in the meeting minutes of the you know, Christ Hospital, uh, we know that they gave money to Paget to go to an auction, the auction of Jonas Moore, actually, to purchase books for the school library, and I know which books that he purchased. So we can kind of uh, you know, reverse engineer the library, at least partially, the catalog of the Royal Mathematical School. So, um, just to, uh, you know, so we have the in, in fragment lists uh, as well in this, uh, in this meta, meta database. Now, another thing that perhaps this approach, this bird's eye view approach misses are the connections between catalogs. So we can treat these catalogs as self-contained, um, as if they're like simply singular buildings, but they can actually be connected. And I will give one example. And this is uh, something that I discovered by accident, so who knows what other researchers are uh, discovering on their own. So on the left, we have the list of Biblioteca Saviliana, Henry Savile's uh, bequest to the Bodleian, well, not the Bodleian Library, but for Oxford uh, in 1619 when he uh, formed the civilian professorship. On the right, we have uh, Dorchester's uh, uh, catalog, which is now at, um, at the Royal College of Physicians. And uh, I'm just going to uh, draw your uh, attention to one copy, well, two copies of the same book. Uh, it's the 1533 Greek edition of Euclid. And we see that somebody has, for Dorchester, I assume someone other than Dorchester, went to Savile's library and actually copied Savile's um, annotations into, into that copy. So we, we know that these, uh, these catalogs um, can be supplemented with uh, identifying these kinds of patterns in individual books and show uh, influences across, across different institutions and across different personal libraries. Just more uh, copied annotations. Where I am at this point is actually, I'm here, I arrived a couple of days ago, and um, the uh, Bibliographical Society uh, grant is for me to study the manuscript catalogs at the British Library and at Cambridge University Library. So I'll be going through the uh, manuscript catalogs, book lists, that, uh, and actually go through them, because a lot of them are dated approximately, so I'll try to figure out, maybe date them, and see how they can kind of fit into this catalog. Because I'm trying to stop it at 1700, but it's very difficult, of course, to be exact when you are dealing with such material that's not dated. Thank you very much, and um, I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Yelda. Gosh, what a, Yelda, what a, what a fascinating um, area of research, and I think that probably almost everyone in this room can't wait to use the database, <laughs> you know, because it kind of fits into so many areas of, of book history. Um, Again, you know, please um, do raise your hand and wait for a microphone for questions from the floor or raise your hand uh, virtually if you're online. Um, but, and forgive me because I don't know that much about the, the database, but so you're capturing, you're digitizing these or how, how can one actually understand the, the contents of these and particularly as you're make, building these links where you just so effectively showed us? It's actually personal research, a lot of it, but I have, um, the problem is current catalogs are very, they're kind of uh, messy in the sense that uh, there are copies, multiple copies on Evo with separate titles, although they are to the same book. And so I have been kind of going through each one in Evo and kind of cleaning it up and kind of identifying the same, uh, the same book. And in some cases, one has 80 pages and one has 20 pages. It's just that that 20 page one is missing pages or other catalogs have mixed in. So it's kind of uh, trying to kind of tease out what's going on in each of these copies. Um, so yeah, I've been using Evo. I have been also looking at actually physical copies of a lot of these things and actually photographing them and uh, going through uh, each of them and trying to see their mathematical content. So it's a lot of work, but you know, COVID stuck at home. <laughs> what else? Exactly. 
Okay. I do. And for an eventual user of the database, though, it, how how much detail will they be able to get out? Will they actually be able to, to you know look at every page, or do you have limits to ego, or how does that work? I think at this point, I'm trying to look at what's feasible. The biggest obstacle is copyright and kind of um, institutional uh, willingness to kind of share their copies, right? Um, but I have been spending a lot of time taking the sort of digital humanities workshops, uh, going through them, try to see the standards and uh, what sort of triple IF standards, like what needs to be done, what kind of funding would be needed to digitize all of these. The copies that I have are less than perfect, the Evo copies from Microconf. And, um, and looking at the actual copies is problematic. Like I'll have to go to the British Library and ask for permission to see the hammer copies, each of them, because uh, they're very fragile and they're not on the high list for conservation. Um, so there are a lot of those kinds of issues. At the point is at this point, um, what I would like to do is release the metadata catalog so that people go and know uh, whose copy of that catalog exists and where it is. Um, but eventually, I think it would be more more useful if you can compare pages. For instance, um, at the Grolier Club, I saw the Macclesfield copy of Bibliotheca Hookiana with a lot of marks. So it could mean that actually the, a lot of the books in the Macclesfield collection actually came from Hook's library and we just weren't aware because Hook didn't annotate all of his books. So it's also useful for tracking provenance. Mm -hmm. um, that could be useful for others than myself. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be ideal to do that, but I'm not sure as an individual I can accomplish that. I think I'm building towards a larger project that I would love to have collaborations on and uh, to make this a bigger, um, more useful tool mm -hmm. to understand provenance and uh, understand the circulation of these books. Mm -hmm. Terrific, great, well thank you for that. Um, any other questions from the audience? Do you have the microphone? Yeah. Or it's just this. So Gaswan Boutros is asking, how easy is it to find direct evidence of Robert Hooke's library other than the catalogues, as we know that most of his possession was not looked after well after his death? Um, we have recorded all the extant books that are from his library have some kind of a sign that uh, show his ownership. In some cases, and Giles Mandelbrot has uh, done a very good study of uh, Sloan's purchases from uh, Hook's auction. So he was able to track some of those to him, and some of them are not marked at all. So Hook did not like marking all of his books for some reason. In some cases, they're rebound, and he liked uh, you know, writing his name in the cover, uh, in the back and uh, front cover, and that's gone now. So we, we can never know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very difficult, it's case by case. There's another online, yeah, another one, yeah. online question from Barbara Bienes. Do the sale catalogues, especially those of the private libraries, usually list mathematical works in manuscript? My impression is that the emphasis is more on printed material than on manuscripts. Um, what I meant by uh, catalogues in print and manuscript is the catalog itself could be a print, in printed catalog or a manuscript catalog of printed works. Um, getting into, and it's been a question that I'm trying to answer for myself, whether I would like to add manuscript lists of manuscripts, if that makes sense. And um, it quickly gets out of hand. It's already a bit out of hand. And um, so I'm trying to curb it. But it, there's always room for growth. My goal is to do something self-contained that can be expanded upon rather than do a half job of you know, a disparate material. So um, trying to be thorough in terms of catalogs of printed works, um, but there are cases where uh, manuscripts are listed, and in one case, I'm trying to remember which one, um, they have actually listed the names of the purchasers of the manuscripts so that they can be tra tracked down later on. So I've seen three copies each containing the names of the purchasers of the manuscripts. So they were kind of uh, worried, I suppose, in terms of this material being lost to knowledge. Great, thank you. If there are no other questions, then I think we will again thank uh, Thank you very much. Invite the next speaker. <laughs>
to introduce Jacob Baxter, who is a PhD candidate at the University of St. Andrews, who is looking at the literary career of the English diplomat William Temple. He did his undergraduate and master's degrees at the same institution, and last year he was awarded the postgraduate Ray Prize. Jacob has been a member of the University Short Title Catalog Project team since the summer of 2019, and he also works part-time at Topping & Company Book Fairs in St. Andrews. Uh, thank you, thank you, Meg, for that very uh, generous introduction. And I'll start by saying a few more thank yous. My first thank you, of course, goes to the uh, Bibliographical Society and to the Oxford Bibliographical Society for their generosity and, of course, for having me along today. Uh, my second thank you goes to the British Public Transport System for getting me here all the way down from St Andrews in just one day and in one piece. How could I ever doubt you? And finally, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you for coming along today, both in the room and online. Good evening. Um, I'd like to begin uh, with a downbeat Scotsman who's far away from home. In 1763, a young ambitious man by the name of James Boswell went to the Dutch Republic to study law. By this point, the Dutch golden age had well and truly fa fa failed, so sorry, faded, as Boswell made clear in a letter to a friend. In such circumstances, this trading nation must be in a very bad way. Most of their principal towns are sadly decayed, and instead of finding every mortal employed, you meet with multitudes of poor creatures who are starving in idleness. You see then that things are very different here from what most people in England imagine. Were Sir William Temple to revisit these provinces, he would scarcely believe the amazing alteration which they have undergone. By the time this letter was written, Sir William Temple, the man at the center of my PhD research, had been dead for over 60 years. Moreover, the book in which Temple had outlined his fascination with the Dutch Republic, his observations upon the United Provinces, was almost a century old. Yet Boswell still returned to this individual and his writings to outline just how far he believed the Dutch Republic had fallen. Now, Temple is a name that is unfamiliar to most today. And I think one reason, to find one reason why this is the case, we need to look no further than that big beast of Victorian Whig history writing, Thomas Babington Macaulay. In a lengthy assessment of Temple, which first appeared in the Edinburgh Review in October 1838, Macaulay argued, Temple is one of those men whom the world has agreed to praise highly without knowing much about them. If the circumstances of the country became such that it was impossible to take any part in politics without some danger, he retired to his library and his orchard. And while the nation groaned under oppression, or resounded with tumult, and with the din of civil arms, amused himself by writing memoirs and tying up apricots. After over 100 pages of critique, Macaulay summarized his opinion of Temple with neither as a writer nor as a statesman, can we allow him any very high place? Temple has never really recovered from this. Whilst the 132 editions by Temple were printed before this acerbic review, only nine have appeared since. Now, my PhD aims to answer just how well known was William Temple before the 19th century. To put it another way, was Macaulay slaying a sacred cow or was he already kicking someone while they were down? Today, I'm going to offer a brief overview of Temple's life and work before showing you how I am investigating the popularity of his writings during the early modern period. Now, Temple twice served as England's ambassador to the Dutch Republic between 1668 and 1670, and again after a brief period of retirement between 1674 and 1679. While he was abroad, Temple negotiated the Triple Alliance between England, Sweden, and the Dutch Republic in 1668, the marriage between Mary Stuart and William of Orange in 1677, and the Treaty of Nijmegen between France and the Dutch Republic in 1678. After he returned home, from the, sorry, after he returned from the United Provinces in 1679, Temple was appointed to the Privy Council. But two years later, he was in effect sacked by Charles II in the aftermath of the exclusion crisis. Temple lived out the rest of his life in retirement, and in 1689, he took on a young Irishman called 
Jonathan Swift uh, as his secretary. Now, Temple died a decade later at the age of 71. During his political career, he had turned down the position of Secretary of State on four separate occasions. Now, Temple's life and politics shaped a diverse literary output. Over the course of four decades, Temple engaged with a wide range of genre as an author. He produced essays on a myriad of different topics, from improving the Irish economy to curing gout. In 1691, Temple also became one of the first English statesmen to publish a memoir of their time in power while they were still alive. But it is indeed his observations upon the United Provinces which remains his most famous book. In this lively and succinct overview of the Dutch Republic, which was written in 1672, Temple famously described the Dutch as the envy of some, the fear of others, and the wonder of all their neighbours. It is a staple of books on the 17th century Dutch Republic today. The Dutch historian Martin Prach has even argued that Temple's observations are probably the best contemporary analysis of Dutch society. It was also an early modern bestseller on a continental scale. Within two years after it was first published in London, another English edition of the observations had been printed and it had also been translated into Dutch, French, German, and Italian. Yet despite this clear popularity, it is worth stressing that of the 74 editions by Temple that were printed in the 17th century, only 29, that's around 40%, were in fact editions of the observations. In Temple, I believe, we have a writer with a broad output which largely goes under the radar. Of course, to work out just how popular Temple was as an early modern author, we first need to know the different ways in which his writings were published in the hand press area. We need to build a bibliography. And over the course of the past year and a half, I've been constructing a bibliography of books by Temple that were printed between 1664, when he published this work on your left, and 1814, exactly 150 years later, when this collection of his works was printed. There are currently 130 different editions by Temple in my database from this period. This more than doubles a previous list for the same period, which was produced by Homer Woodbridge in the 1940s. The editions in my database range from single broadsheets to large multi-volume compendia. Over half of them were printed outside the British Isles. Unsurprisingly, Temple was especially popular in the Dutch Republic, the country which he seldom criticized in his writing. In the United Provinces, he outsold a number of his contemporaries and countrymen, including Andrew Marvell, John Milton, John Bunyan, and John Locke, who actually lived in the Dutch Republic between 1683 and 1689. Today, over 470 libraries in the world have an early modern book by Temple in their collection, and this number continues to grow every week as I work on this database. This process of building a bibliography through national title catalogues, library catalogues, and contemporary references has revealed some really interesting finds. Take, for instance, this book. This is a Russian translation of Temple's essays, which was published in St. Petersburg in 1778. Now, with these bibliographical building blocks largely in place, I'm now looking to examine as many different copies of Temple's books as possible. And this is where I'm especially grateful to the Faulkner Madam Award, because Oxford as a city has more books by Temple in its libraries than any other place on the planet, including London. And I look forward to examining as many of those as I can in the coming weeks. Now, why do this? Well, of course, it gives me a chance to transcribe books and also identify even more additions for my database but it also allows me to examine evidence of readership, and this is crucial in determining Temple's literary, literary reputation. Now, physical additions to books, as I'm sure you all know, including signatures, printed book plates, stamps, and decorative bindings, offer a fairly reliable way of ascertaining book ownership. For instance, if we look at this copy of the observations, which you'll find at the John Rylands Library in Manchester, you'll find four different owners by just looking inside it. We have two individuals, which you can see in the red. We have Charles Wellesley, the great Methodist hymn writer, who got his book in 1755 from an old friend, and his namesake son. But we also can find two institutions, Richmond Collins' College in Surrey and the Methodist Archives and Research Center. But also alongside marks of ownership, we can find instances of engagement. For example, in this copy of Temple's Miscellanea from Edinburgh University Library, this, this, sorry, this copy of Temple's Miscellanea from Edinburgh University Library is strewn with annotations. 
Below the phrase, the great miscarriages of life come from the want of a good pilot, one re reader has written, how true. I wouldn't disagree. Um, elsewhere in the same book, when Temple discusses the dangers of having large armies, another reader from 1791 has noticed how applicable to this, to this present state of France. Now, of course, physical encounters are not the only way of identifying book owners. Book lists, such as auction catalogues, library catalogues, etc., and contemporary references can also point toward different readers. And these three different ways of identifying owners have, have helped me to construct yet another database of over 250 different owners of Temple's books. And I anticipate that this number will go considerably when I finally go to Oxford. Now, this includes some individuals who had a profound impact upon the political, cultural, and intellectual environments of their day including Edmund Burke, Thomas Carlyle, Winston Churchill, George III, Robert Hooke, John Locke, Isaac Newton, Samuel Pepys, Leopold von Ranke, Walter Scott, and Adam Smith. But there are others with more modest occupations in there as well who also own books by Temple, such as the astronomer John Lee, the Irish noblewoman Anne Atchison, and the Dutch beer brewer Johannes de Planck, who had at least four books by Temple in his library. Now, on occasion, these different ways of identifying owners can combine in really interesting ways. Take, for instance, this copy of the works of Sir William Temple, which was printed in 1731. Now, a signature on this clearly demonstrates that it belonged to John Adams, second president of the United States. And Adams' correspondence is, in turn, littered with references to Temple. In one letter from June 1776, which was sent from the exhausting negotiations at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, Adams wrote... When a few mighty matters are accomplished here, I retreat like senators to the plough and Sir William Temple to his garden. And farewell to politics. I am weary. Now, Adams, of course, went on to represent the United States in the Dutch Republic as it was fighting the British in the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War. Now, Abigail Adams sent a letter of encouragement to her husband whilst he was doing this. I wish your powers may extend to an alliance with them and that you may be successful against the artifices of Britain as a former ambassador was against those of another nation when he negotiated the Triple Alliance in the course of five days. I should add that there is no similarity in the character of my friend and the gentleman whose memoirs I have read with great pleasure. Now, there can be no doubt, in my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, who the gentleman in this letter is. Oh, and by the way, in the interest of balance, I should add that Thomas Jefferson also had a copy of Temple's works, but it went up in flames in 1851, during a library, during the fire that badly damaged its then home, the Library of Congress. Now, Abigail Adams was hardly alone in her admiration for Temple. In 1744, Alexander Pope told Joseph Spence that Temple was an authority on English vocabulary. In 1778, the great lexicographer Samuel Johnson, who mentioned Temple on 54 different occasions in his dictionary, told Boswell that William Temple was the first writer who gave cadence to English prose. Now, today I have outlined you the life, output, and just a few examples of some receptions of an author who has now largely been forgotten. The Bibliographical Society has made an invaluable contribution to my research into Sir William Temple, which I hope will not only shed new light on this fascinating individual, but also provide further insight into early modern authorship and the shaping of literary reputations. Now, I began with, with a reference to Temple that was written over 60 years after he died. I'll end with one that was uh, written when he was very much still alive. As I mentioned earlier, in 1691, Temple published a memoir. It recounted his trials and tribulations as he helped to negotiate several different peace treaties, which were signed at Nijmegen in 1678 and 1679 between an array of different European powers, including France, Spain, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and the Dutch Republic. Of course, by the time Temple's memoir was published, these peace settlements had disintegrated with the outbreak of yet more conflict. But for some, this book offered a source of hope. In 1693, the Quaker William Penn published this, an essay on how he believed a European peace could be achieved through either a continental diet, parliament, or a state. And I quote for you now its final paragraph. To conclude, I have very little answer to all of the, to, in all this affair, because if it succeeds, I have so little to deserve. For this great king's example tells us it is fit to be done. And Sir William Temple's history shows us, by surpassing instance, that it may be done. And Europe, by her incomparable miseries, makes it necessary to, to be done. My share is only thinking of it at this juncture and putting it into the common light for the peace and prosperity of Europe. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Oh, that's very kind of you. Well, that's probably something I'll have to investigate a little bit more when I when I hopefully go out go out to Russia and go and see it. But I would imagine so. Because that, I just wonder how much that would have influenced. Yeah. Well, I believe it's it's a, it's a translation of a German German translation of some of Campbell's essays. So. There may be there may be a link there worth uh, exploring. As far as I'm aware, I don't think there is actually an, int an introduction to it. It just goes straight in. So, yeah, I think that that require a little bit a little bit more research there. Such a runaway success over his other works. Well, first, I think to say to that is it. It was, it was a big success indeed. I think his memoir that I talked about very briefly at the end does run it close. It doesn't quite become as well translated, but it, but it is still quite popular. But I think the observations is such a success because um, one, one, two reasons really. One, um, Temple is very open, unlike a, lot of other, unlike a lot of his other works, with putting his name front and center on it. So this is, this is an observation coming from a man who has been at the heart of Dutch politics. This is, this is as good as access as you're going to get. I think that's one reason why it does so well. And another is it is just fantastically well written. I'd recommend it to all of you to read it. It's like, it reads almost like a, like a travel guide. And, and its insights are sharp you know, and, and, and fascinating. And that's why I think it continues to appear in many books on the Dutch Republic today. Thank you. Making it a true bookseller as well. I'm sure <laughs> orders are coming into topping and company. Uh. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, any other? Questions or comments? Okay. Well, I think we may then draw the meeting to a close, but I want to just thank our three panelists. Again, thank you so much for coming to join us, and good luck with your research, and we're really proud to have been able to grant you our anniversaries and take part in some minor role in your progress. So thank you again. see many of you um, on Thursday at the book that changed my life um, and on the 30th of November for the first of the Knudsen lectures. Thank you for coming. <laughs>